Last time we introduced the concept of a small step interpreter, and we talked about the idea of contexts, which allow us to simply write down the rules for it. Now one thing though about the context that we wrote before, which recall were the following, C is either the whole or an if with a context in the first position, an if with a context in the second position, or an if with a context in the last position, or an application where we have some number of expressions, a context, and then some number of more expressions. Now, the problem with this way of writing down contexts is it is too big. Notice that we could write down something like the following. We could write down if true, a context, three, and then inside of that we could have plus one one. Now our rules would allow us to turn this program right here into if true. Actually let's just change this to false. False, false, two, three. So that means that we could take a program that started as if false, one plus one, three, and turn that into if false two three. Now this is weird because it allows us to do evaluation inside of arguments. Also notice that what it does is because this says e dot 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 context here, that means that there can be a context in any order. Normally what we want, however, is we want to evaluate the condition of an if before we evaluate the branches, and we want to evaluate the arguments to a function in order from left to right. So we can restrict the set of contexts to a smaller one, so-called evaluation contexts. So evaluation contexts E to the following set, where E is either the whole or it is an if E E or it is a sequence of values, notice that values have already been turned into values, means they've already been evaluated, then a context, then a sequence of expressions. What this does is it guarantees that the argument, sorry, the condition is evaluated before the branches and the arguments are evaluated in order. Now what we can do is we can write down the step relation more, we can write down the step relation again where we say if we have a step that goes from if false et ef will equal e of ef. Then we can write down step of e if v not inside of false. E T E F is just E T. And then finally, step of E P V dot 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 goes to E delta P V dot dot dot. Now this is a more succinct way of writing down our small step relation. We can now write our uh, interpreter in the following way. We can write down an interpreter like this. We can say interp of e is equal to, now we're going to introduce uh, an additional function. This additional function is going to be called um, parse. And its job is to take an expression and split it up into an evaluation context and a redx. So we're going to say case parse, actually let's call it find redx, sorry. Find redx of e. Now, find redx might not find one, so that means one of its possibilities to return is false, in which case there is no redx, so what we'll do is we'll just return e. Otherwise, it could return a pair of an evaluation context and then a reducible expression R. 
in which case we will say um, let r prime equal step of r in calling interp on e of r prime. Notice that this notation means we plug. So basically the way that we do it, our interpreter, is we call find red x. If it's false, we return e. Otherwise we have the context and then the reducible expression. And then what we do is we um, call step on the reducible expression, which applies one of these three rules. And then we plug that back into e and we call interp. Let's look at the definition of this find read x function. Find read x takes an e and returns false or a pair of an e and an e. And its implementation is very simple. I'm going to abbreviate it as fr because it's going to take too long to write otherwise. So frv is just equal to false because there's no red x there fr of ifs ec et ef is equal to the following. First what we do is we're going to say let, actually not let, let's do case. We're going to say case fr of ec. So what we're doing is we're going to call find red x on this piece inside of here. And if it says false, then what we're going to do is we're going to return the following thing. We're going to return an if with a hole in it, and then et, ooh, sorry, I made a mistake. If there's no red x there, then we're going to return a hole and this whole expression. Let's call it e. Because the idea here is that if we try to find a red x inside of ec and there is none, then that means that it must be a value, in which case we are the red x. Otherwise, there's an e and then the reducible expression r, in which case we want to return an if with that evaluation context, et, ef, and then we return r outward. Next, if we call fr and we give it an expression, oops, and it's called with an application that has some sequence of values, it has some sequence of values, and then some first expression, which we'll call e0. Then it has more expressions, which we'll call em dot dot dot. Actually, you know what? Um, we need to change this. Sorry. There's going to be there's going to be uh, two situations. So if it's called with just a sequence of values, then in that case, we just want to return a whole and e, because we know that we're done. If instead we're called with a sequence of values and then some first expression and then some more, then in that case what we want to do is we want to call, we want to let E R be equal to F R of E zero in returning V dot 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 big E E M dot 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 and then the reducible expression R. So what we're doing here is when we're given an application, we first check to see if everything is a value. If everything is a value, then we return the whole. 
Otherwise, what we do is we take the first thing that wasn't a value, call fr on it, which we know it's not a value, so therefore we know that we're going to get a pair, and then we include that pair as part of the context, and then return back the r. So let's walk through a little example of how this runs. So suppose that we want to evaluate the program plus 1 times 2, 3. Okay, so the first thing that happens is, is that we're going to call find redx on this. It's going to look and say plus is a value, 1 is a value, that's not a value. So therefore, we're going to call find redx on that. It's then going to say times is a value, 2 is a value, 3 is a value, therefore it's going to return um, a whole in that. So that means that the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to calling find redx on times 2, 3 is going to return a whole and times 2, 3. Then that call will happen inside of here, so then calling find redx on this whole thing is going to return a plus one whole, and then inside of that is the times two, three. Then we're going to call step on times two, three. So we call step on times two, three, which is going to return delta of times two, three, which is going to return six. Then we're going to take 6 and we're going to plug it in to this. So we're going to call plug of plus 1 whole and 6, which is going to get us 7. Sorry. Which is going to get us 7. Which is going to get us plus 1, 6. And then that plus 1, 6 we are going to call interp on it. And we called find redx, called step, called plug, and now we call interp again. Calling interp again on plus one six, we're going to call find redx on it. So we're going to call find redx on plus one six, which is going to return a whole and plus one six, which we're going to call step on. which is going to give us 7. Then we're going to call plug on the whole and 7 and give us back 7. Then we're going to call interp on that, which is going to call find redex on it. So we're going to call follow find redex on 7 and we're going to get back false. And since we got back false, that means that we're done and then we're going to return the answer, which is 7. That's how we turn plus 1 times 2, 3 into 7. All right. Now, at this point, what page are we on? Now, at this point, um, we can talk about the efficiency of doing this. Now, imagine that we have some really, really, really big program. So we have some big program. Now, when I say big program, I mean one that you know takes like seven pages of text to keep track of. And then inside of there, there's a little plus one times two, three in it. So that means that we're going to evaluate this thing right here, and we're going to plug into it. We're going to take that answer, and then we're going to go plug it in and get back plus one six. And then we're going to parse that whole thing and get back, and we're going to plug it in it again, and we're going to get back seven. So notice that if we go look at this algorithm, find redex is linear in the size of the input, and plug is linear in the size of the input too. So what that means is that one round of interp takes linear plus constant, step is constant, plus linear. So that means we take two linear steps plus a constant amount of work. 
What we would really like is a way of getting something that took um, that took a uh, a constant amount of work every single step of the interpreter. But to do that, we have to change the way that things work a little bit. We have to introduce what is called a machine model. Here's the idea of a machine model. We have our language, which we write as E. What we're going to do is we're going to write a function that's going to be called inject. And what it's going to do is it's going to take our language E and turn it into a machine that we're going to, a machine object that we're going to call a state, ST. Then every step of on E is going to give us a new thing inside of the language space E prime. And then over here in the machine, we're going to be able to take a bunch of small steps that's going to give us a new machine value that we'll call ST prime. Then we can take that and extract it and get back the very same E prime that we would have got along the step. Whereas this step right here potentially takes linear time, each one of these is going to take constant time. And it turns out that there's not going to be a linear number of these. It's actually going to be more efficient. Now what we're going to do is we're going to have a variety of different machines, and we're going to start from a really simple one that's actually not that efficient, but then we'll tweak it a little bit and we'll get one that's really efficient. Ultimately, what we're going to do is we're going to have our language as a high-level um, concept, and our machine we're going to be able to implement in low-level C code that's very, very efficient. So we're going to go on a little journey of a few different kinds of machines, and as we make them more complicated, we'll have them get closer to the way that uh, real interpreters for languages like, I don't know, like uh, you may have heard of V8, which is uh, a fast interpreter for uh, JavaScript that's built into Chrome, for instance, how those things work. Okay, so the first machine that we're going to build is one that's called the CC0 machine. And the CC0 machine, all machines are defined by what their state is. Its state is going to be the following. It's going to be a pair of an expression and an evaluation context. The inject function that takes an expression and turns it into one of these state values is going to be very simple. It's just going to pair the expression with the whole. And this extract function is also going to be simple. Its extract function is going to take the expression paired with the context and just plug it. Okay. Now notice that inject and extract are an identity. However, there's going to be a different uh, relation for modifying states. Technically it's also a small step, but we're going to write it down in a different way. We're going to write it down as a relation state arrow with a little flat part state. And so that's going to be our, um, our step function for, uh, for these states. So here are the rules for it. The first rule says that if EC, ET, EF, E will go to EC, E, where we fill in the hole with an if, a hole, ET and EF. What's going on here? What this step relation is doing is it's going to encode simultaneously parse, sorry, find read X and um, step and plug. It's going to incorporate them all together into one, um, one, uh, one function. So essentially what's going on right here is the find redex part of the small step interpreter for the J1 language. When it saw an if, the first thing that it needs to do is it needs to go look at the EC. Now suppose that it looked at that EC and it found 
a false. If it found a false, and then the thing that was in the context was an E, where at the bottom was if whole, I should probably make it, I should probably be consistent using the box, whole ET EF, then in that case what we're going to do is we're going to move the EF from in there out to here, and then we're going to leave the E alone. Okay. And then similarly, if we have some other value, and these rules are um, in order, so any, uh, we're going to look at the rules in order, so I don't have to write v not false here, because they, it's, uh, we know it's not false because the earlier case didn't hit. If whole et ef is going to go to et e. So notice that what we're doing is we're delaying doing the plugging back into here until later. We're making it so that we just pull off just one piece of that out and move it to the left. Next, if we have an application where you have an E0 and then more, followed by some context, what we're going to do is we're going to focus on that E0 and then save off the rest of the context inside of the evaluation context. And then when that ultimately becomes a value and we have some sequence of other values, let's call them the before values, and then some whole, and then we have the after expressions, and there's at least one of those, we'll call that E0. Then we can focus on that new E0, take the context, leave the before values, and then this new one, this V, and then put in the whole, and then the E afters. And then eventually we're going to get a value and this value is going to be the last one, Vn. And then our context is going to have a primitive at the very top, all the V befores, and then a hole and nothing after it. And then what we'll do is we'll turn that into delta P vb dot 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 vn and then the e okay so this right here is the entire cc0 machine it incorporates in this step and this step the job of find redux in these two steps it incorporates the job of stepping. In these two, it also incorporates the job, sorry, in this one, it incorporates the job of stepping. And in this one, it incorporates the job of plugging and find redux simultaneously. And in general, what's happening right here is we're delaying find redux until later. Let's step through an entire example of the CC0 machine running. So suppose that we want to run it on plus one times two, three. So the first thing that we do is we call inject. And we get back plus one times two, three, and then a hole. All right? So then what we do is we focus on that plus, and we have the hole, and then we're filling it with another hole right here, and then one times two, three. Okay? Then that plus is a value, so we move that value into there and move the one out. So we have one, and then the hole, and then a, a plus right here, and then the hole is moved over, and the times two, three is still there. Then we move the times two, three out. 
we have the whole still the same. Then we have a plus one and then a whole. Okay, so now that is another application. So we need to focus on the times. So we have the first hole and inside of it is plus one hole. And then inside of that is a hole two, three. Then that times we move it out and move in the two. So we have two hole filled with plus one whole, filled with times whole three. Then we have three whole plus one whole times two whole, okay? I just realized that one thing that I want to do is uh, let's label all these rules. So this is rule one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. So which rules did we use? So far we've only used rules four and five. So this right here is inject. This right here is rule four. This is rule five. This is rule five. This is rule four, this is rule five, this is rule five. Now we're about to use rule six, because rule six says if we have a value and then the thing at the bottom is an application where the hole is in the end, then we can actually call delta. So we call delta, so we use rule six, and we call delta on times two, three, and we get back six. And we take that six and what do we do with it? We put it in that spot right there. So we get a six and then a hole and then plus one hole. Well, now that's another use of rule six. And here we're gonna call delta on plus one six and get back seven. So then we get seven and then a hole and at that point, we're done because no rule applies any longer. And since no rule applies any longer, we call extract. And we get back 7. So this is the CC0 machine running. And this is a simpler model of small step evaluation than... Uh, than this one, because it has only one set of rules. There are three rules for doing uh, work. That's rule um, two, three, and six. Uh, and then there are three rules that combine the job of find, redex, and plugging. However, it turns out that it is still inefficient. And the reason it's still inefficient is, is that what I did right here in this example is technically incorrect, because this plug operation right here, I've written it out as if it didn't really happen, that we were just saving it for later. But in reality, we would have to actually do that plugging. We would have to actually take this thing right here, plug it into that hole, this thing right here, plug it into that hole. And then every time we did a rule, we would have to do a parsing step. We would have to look at the evaluation context and see whether or not the thing at the bottom matches what we expect it to be. And that is inefficient. So what we'll look at next time is another kind of machine that doesn't have this problem that allows us to um, uh, allows us to save the evaluation something like the evaluation context more efficiently. So we'll talk about that next time.